Good morning. It's good to be here. Um, start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I started my career as a family lawyer in D.C. and very early on discovered I was the only Spanish-speaking attorney in the District of Columbia who knew anything about what a protection order was. And so I started off as a family lawyer representing immigrant victims of violence against women, protection order cases, um, that anybody who didn't speak English, basically, for about 17 years, and had the opportunity at that time, I also co-founded with groups around the country an organization called the National Network to End Violence Against Immigrant Women. And the goal of that was to bring together people like you, people that are working in the community. We have about 1,000 members now, 3,000 members now, um, legal aid programs, shelters, rape crisis centers, um, government folks that work in DCFS and government folks that maybe we have police and former police, retired DHS folks. Um, <clears throat> and we try to advocate and share information about the current laws and practices and and innovative best practices in working with immigrant victims of violence against women. So, and in that role, um, I've been involved in drafting the immigration protections and welfare access protections for immigrant victims of violence against women and in working with the House and Senate um, bipartisan members to um, accomplish those as part of the Violence Against Women Act. So what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit about some of the dynamics of domestic violence as experienced by immigrant victims. And, and their legal rights, and in, in the areas of, I'm gonna give you an overview of both of immigration, er, immigration issues, family law issues, and public benefits access. Um, before I start, I just wanted to get a sense, are there particular things that people are interested in learning, like in terms of why you came today? I wanna be sure that cover and emphasize the things that you're interested in. Particular issues? Questions that you'd like to be sure are answered by the end of the presentation? Yes? Just, just the increased vulnerability of immigrant women in their intimate relationships. Right. So the, how, how immigrant women are in, have an increased vulnerability in those relationships, yes, we'll be talking about some of the dynamics of power and control for that. Absolutely. Any other things? I guess I'm curious about the backlash of new laws. I mean, we see a lot in domestic violence. Every time there's any new legislation that supposedly is to help there's always a backlash where they end up getting prosecuted more, arrested more, and right. I'm wondering what the backlash is in the immigration community. Right, and, and the backlash issues are coming up in two ways, both because there's protections and people think maybe they made it up or whatever, or they're, 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 some of the backlash we see has to do with anytime there's anti-immigrant times. So for example, in 1996, when the immigration reform was being written in 96, <clears throat> I would get calls from shelters in the middle of America saying, you know, with, with board members who were nervous saying, we have an undocumented woman in our shelter, who do I report her to? And so we know that that's a violation of civil rights laws and, and our funding, all, all funding that goes to shelters that is state or federal funding, certainly in California and other parts of the country, is unrestricted with regard to immigration status, and we'll be talking about that. So we do, I will definitely talk about some of the current issues that are happening now at this time that I would call, let's say, back at backlash issues. There's some very significant things we're seeing both in the immigration context and in the family law context. So, great. Okay, so I'm gonna start. Um, what I wanna do is I'm gonna start with a little bit of background and statistics to talk about some of the dynamics of how immigrant victims, can you guys, oops, that's my one. <laughs> is it gonna, does it have to be that dark? Oh, does it have to be that dark? Oh, I'll fall asleep by the end of this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And, and you guys can follow along, actually, if it's possible to put the room light back on you. Um, and you guys have the slides in your presentation, so you can follow along that way. That's probably better, right? People see? No, no, no. Is there, do people, can you guys see okay? Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, one of the things that we see is that there is a heightened rate incidence of domestic violence lifetime abuse reported by immigrant victims as compared to the U.S. population. And what we found is, what research has found is that immigrant women stay longer, 
have fewer resources and suffer more severe physical and emotional injuries as a result of domestic violence than the general population in the US. We also have found that immigrant women have high rates of sexual assault, particularly when you talk about vulnerabilities in the first two years after immigration and, and when they're newly in this country. And one of the reasons we think that is is that they've, they've severed contact with their home country, they're coming to a new environment. Culturation is a really difficult barrier. But also, there is amazing levels of sexual assault, both that, that, the, that domestic violence survivors that were interviewing around the country from different cultures have experienced in their home countries, in the process of immigration, and then it, that increases their vulnerability once they get here. Um, we also are seeing some significantly high rates of child sexual abuse among children that are immigrating, young women, young girls and children immigrating to the United States. There's been research, uh, recent research among Boston high school students, um, girls about rates of uh, uh, sexual assault or sexual abuse in their childhood, and that they're finding that Latina immigrant women, girls, have much higher rates than anyone else. And one of the reasons that we are, we believe that's happening it has to do not necessarily with the Latino culture and population, it's probably happening across immigrant populations. It has to do with the breakdown of the family. So that you see a lot of young girls and boys being raised in families, in the second family, like with the stepfather, or, an ex or the stepfather and his extended family. So you potentially have more male perpetrators that are, don't have a strong familial connection to that child. But it's something in terms of those of you that are working with immigrant women and families and, and young uh, immigrant youth, is you should be asking about this because there probably are trauma histories that would be useful to identify so that the victim can get the help she needs. Um, the, what have we found, uh, what some of the research has found is that there's a strong connection between immigration-related abuse and immigration power and control and domestic violence. And one of the things we looked at, well, we did research that looked at immigrant victims who were those, most of whom were undocumented, and that they were married, whether they were married or not, or in a relationship or not with US citizens and lawful permanent residents. And the lifetime abuse rates among immigrant women that we're finding nationally across cultures is closer, it can be as high as 49.8% lifetime domestic abuse. However, when we look at the, um, when we look at immigrant women who are married or formerly married to US citizens, national born US citizens, what we're finding is that the abuse rate drops to almost three times the national average. And the reason for that is we understand that abusers are using power and control over the immigration stat over immigration status of the victim as a control power and control tool, as a tactic. And when we interview, when we look at victims that we've interviewed in surveys, and we look at those whose husbands could legally file immigration papers on their behalf, what we find is 72.3% of those that could file papers on their behalf who are abusers never filed. And so this idea that if you marry a citizen, you get papers, isn't working in this population. It doesn't happen. Because even those who choose to file delay almost four years before they file again. And so what we found is, is that this threat of immigration, this immigration-related abuse, is a very powerful tool that locks immigrant victims into relationships. It leads to them staying longer. It leads to the delays in their beginning, in learning about or finding out or trying to access help. It will prevent, and that we found that 65% of immigrant victims who are also reporting um, physical and sexual assault um, are, or sexual abuse are also reporting immigration related abuse. And then finally, and this is, I think, the reason we talk about this, we found, uh, one of the reasons I love to do research, is, to work with as the lawyer on the research team or the policy person on the research team is, this is a classic example of finding out something I wouldn't have believed was true. From my experience working with 
uh, immigrant victims of the at, at immigrant domestic violence survivors <clears throat> at Ayuda, I would have believed that basically any time there was emotional abuse or physical or sexual abuse, there were threats of deportation. But what we found is that's not true. What we found is there's a 10 times higher rate of <clears throat> uh, immigration related abuse in relationships where there is also physical and sexual abuse. There's a strong correlation between the two. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, me as a family lawyer, it means that I've got corroboration. Yeah, and then that part of that emotional, that, that, that um, immigration related abuse is a corroboration of what she's telling me about the physical and sexual abuse. And I can take that seriously and I should put evidence on it. But what it also means to, um, is that I have a tool, knowing and recognizing immigration-related re abuse, that can give, or we all do, that can help us understand that either there's physical sexual abuse in this relationship she's not telling us about yet, or the level of abuse in this relationship is escalating. And so for those of you that are seeing women earlier on, and from a prevention perspective, if you if she's telling you that he's going to report it to DHS, that he's filed papers and he's going to withdraw them, that he's going to have her to deported, etc., those are things we should take seriously. Kind of in the way that years ago, um, when any of us were doing this work and our clients came in and they said he cut the telephone cord, okay, he cut off her ability to make a phone call for help. It's the same kind of an indicator, um, this kind of, when you hear this kind of abuse in a relationship. We also wanted to understand when immigrant women, particularly undocumented immigrant women, would be willing to pick up the phone. When do they pick up the phone and they themselves call the police for help? Because we believe that, we hope that understanding this would help us understand um, help seeking among immigrant victims and supporting victims to come forward sooner. And what we learned, not surprisingly, that the longer they're in the United States, the more acculturated they are, the more likely they are to call for help, call police for help. But interestingly, what we found is, and we looked, it didn't matter how many assaults there were, it didn't matter whether she was hospitalized, it didn't matter, nothing, that, that no level of abuse correlated with her willingness to call. What we found was instead that nobody called for help unless they'd already talked to two or more people about the abuse. So my first question to you this morning is who do you think they're talking to? Who are the women calling for help or who are they talking to about the abuse? The religious leader. Religious leader is a little bit under 10%. What else? Yeah? Family. family. Which family? Who said mothers? Grandma. Number one. Two? Sisters. sisters. Three, we can stop there. That's it. They're talking to their mothers and their sisters. But you, actually, that's two and three. Who's the number one person they talk to? Pardon? What kind of friend? No, a friend, but what gender friend? Right, a female friend. That's number one. So that's what's happening, is they're talking, and when we're talking about mothers, sisters, and female friends, 70, 80, 60, 70, 80% of the women, that's who they're talking to. And then when you look at interviewing women and who they talk to, it goes from like 60 to 10. And then the 10%, you know, the 10% line is clergy, is another battered woman, and good news for you guys, a victim advocate, and this violence victim advocate. That's around 10%. The rest of us, lawyers, healthcare workers, police, we're all way down below the 10%. And even though many women go to lawyers because of immigration issues or other, they don't talk to the lawyers about the abuse. Same thing with healthcare providers. So that's one of the things we have to, we've been as, an, as a movement trying to change. What we also found interestingly and I certainly saw this in our, my practice, is that um, immigrant women begin have more courage to seek help when they begin to see that the violence is shifting towards their kids. So women whose kids are witnessing violence were more willing to pick up the phone and call for help. And the good news here is women who had found the courage to come forward and get protection orders 
called for help to enforce them. And these are immigrant women, including undocumented women. Biggest negative factor, no surprise, uh, immigration status. And what we found is, is that reporting rates of domestic violence, even among naturalized citizen and local permanent resident immigrant women, who have no danger of you know, being deported, they're calling it much lower rates than the average in the US. And then the, the less stable the woman's immigration status is, the, more like, the least likely she'll be called. Well, the other thing that we found, and I know there's former DCFS and current DCFS people here, um, is that among immigrant women, there's a strong correlation between women who are able and try to do help seeking, try to go to an agency to get help, whether it's an advocate or a lawyer or a healthcare professional, or, but they come out about the domestic violence and talk to somebody about it. <clears throat> the women who seek help, including family court help and immigration relief, the co-occurrence of child abuse in those cases among immigrant women drops dramatically. So that these are, we've been able to see through the research that helping immigrant moms really does help their kids. And it lowers the, 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 the coexistence of abuse against the kids. Some of it may be because they're actually leaving. Um, others may be that they're able to take more control and <coughs> so we don't know exactly the factors we're looking into it more, but um, it really makes a huge difference. And one of the other things, and one of the reasons I'm certainly so committed to doing these kinds of trainings is this is unpublished, this is research that's been submitted to a National Institutes of Justice. We haven't journal published it yet. But essentially what we found, we looked at protection orders and the willingness of immigrant survivors to get domestic violence victims to get protection orders. They, those that were undocumented, those were documented. We want to understand their decision-making process, but we also wanted to stand, understand what led them to get orders and how they felt about them. And one of the most dramatic things we found is that you guys are all doing your jobs. And what I mean by that is that um, 60, we, we worked with legal services and advocate programs across the country to interview their own clients. And what we found was 61% of the immigrant women who walked into that shelter, domestic violence agency, legal services agency, seeking help for domestic violence, didn't even know what a protection order was when they walked through the door. So the first person who told them about a protection order was the advocate, was counselor, or an attorney. Despite that, 81% of the women who, in that survey, who didn't know about, it, including those that didn't know about protection orders, got protection orders. And we also found there was a hugely strong correlation between the level of physical and sexual abuse and the severity of the violence and these immigrant victims, undocumented immigrant victims, willing to get protection orders. Which means that the advocates doing and the attorneys doing safety planning were identifying lethality, identifying the dangers, and the victim and feeling and the victims were feeling supportive and supported enough to be able to go get the orders. And that 96% of the women, even though they had lots of trepidation about whether this was going to increase stage or how difficult it would be, 96% of them found it helpful. And when we looked six months after, we looked at people who'd gotten them six months ago, or we looked at, at people that had, been, had the order for at least six months, what we found out is that the physical abuse dropped dramatically as a result of the order. And that, but that, if you look at it in terms of from a health care model as opposed to a legal model, the orders were being violated. There were some, there are two major areas of violation. Not surprising, stay away orders. They, they continued to call them and didn't totally stay away. And, um, but the second largest was immigration related abuse. The orders, 68.3% of the victims reported ongoing immigration related abuse even though the physical and sexual abuse had dropped. So they worked to increase the lethality or the severity of the violence itself, but the power and control, particularly through immigration status, continues. Yes? Are you able to differentiate between spouses who are, who are citizens versus spouses who are not in terms of the level of 
Um, actually, we haven't been able, we don't see it in terms of the level of use, we see it I mean, in, terms of the, in terms of those that got protection <coughs> orders. Yeah. We haven't looked at the data that way, we could. It's a, it's a good idea to see, I mean, we know that citizens are more likely to abuse, the frequency is more. Be because the men, what we, what we see is that um, U.S. citizen men who choose to marry foreign born women, part of that process may be because they're looking for somebody with different that, that, that they believe will be more subservient or will come, you know, will culturally be different in some way. My guess is here. that those numbers would drop if you looked at the actual policy. Yeah, the numbers would, you're, you're, the those num numbers would drop. That U.S. citizen men are more likely or less likely? No, that, that the women, the immigrant women getting the protective orders, there would be a fewer percentage of them married to citizens who go to get the protective orders. That, that's my, right. I mean, I, I'm right. asking you. Yeah, I don't know. We have to look. We were, our survey was made up of uh, 50 or 60 percent undocumented women. Many of them were, could have, were VAWA cases so that they could have been married to a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. Um, but we, we, will, we can look at that. Okay, so what I want to do, any other questions, issues about dynamics? Does that give you a bit of a picture of what we're talking about? Okay, I'm going to move now to um, talk about what kinds of services and assistance we can provide, and I'm going to start with undocumented women. There are some women that may come to you that let's say their perpetrator is their U.S. citizen boyfriend. So they're not a VAWA self-petitioning case. They would have to get a crime victim visa. And let's assume for now, or it was a rape victim who's afraid to call the police and doesn't want to want to talk about the rape. And the reason I use those two examples is I want to talk about what immigrant victims of domestic violence and sexual assault can get who are totally undocumented and who may not pursue or may never qualify for immigration. Because I want us to understand that there's a lot of things we can provide and help victims receive that has nothing to do with whether we ever resolve her immigration issues, okay? Fortunately, I get to stand up here very differently than 15 years ago, and we're in a world where there is immigration relief and options. When I first started doing their work, this, this work, I was working as a family lawyer and as an advocate, and there weren't immigration options, but there now are. But I'm going to be talking first about what people can get when they're um, totally undocumented. They can get protection orders in every state in the country. There's nothing in the family laws of the courts, and, and constitutional law basically says anybody in this country without regard to their citizenship or nationality or national origin can go into a court and get a protection order and can basically be sued and sue in U.S. courts. They can get a protection order. They can get emergency shelter. They can get transitional housing. How many of you, have any of you had difficulties getting transitional housing for any of your clients? Yes, I always get hands in the room. Um, what's going on with transitional housing is in 2001, uh, then Secretary Cuomo of uh, the Department of Housing, HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, issued a statement to all their programs saying anybody who gets any HUD money is required to provide service, shelter and emergency, emergency shelter and transitional housing for up to two years to any um, immigrant victim of domestic violence. Um, child abuse or anybody who's homeless. Notice sexual assault isn't on the list at the time. People weren't thinking about sexual assault as much as they are today and understanding the needs there. Sexual assault victims would get housing under this um, uh, policy as potentially homeless. So if they have to flee a home where they were raped and because the rapist might come back or because they just can't emotionally and physically stay there anymore, then they're at risk of being homeless if they don't go into one of these programs and they can get shelter up that way. But what happens is the law, it's one of these interesting things in the law where you have a statement from the federal government saying this is open to everybody without regard to immigration status. And they have program rules that say in order to get into transitional housing, you have to show that you have some kind of an income stream that you can actually transition. 
And what happens is, is some transitional housing programs around the country say, okay, if she has to have income, then the only way I can prove income is ask her for what? Pardon? Social security number, immigration status, so legal document, or a work authorization, right? Well, if the government, federal government is saying this is open to have people who are undocumented, how are they going to have those three things? They aren't. And so what happens is, is the programs just turn people away because they say they can't prove their income. They don't say they're turning away because they're undocumented, they're turning away because they don't have a green card, uh, work authorization, or social security number. Well, I happen to know that you guys are all living in a place where undocumented people can open up bank accounts, right? So, in a, at Ayuda in the old days where I worked, what we used to do is I literally, in order to prove that my clients were bringing in money, because a lot of our clients are doing what? Well. Are they working? Yeah. And so they're working at jobs that, without legal permission, right? By the way, that's, let me ask you, let me just raise one issue. Um, if they're working at jobs without legal permission, that's, that's okay. I mean, we, none of us can teach them how to do that, help them get those jobs, because we can get in trouble. But ironically, um, immigrant victims who do work may, as opposed to those who don't, may ultimately be able to get their lawful permanent residency more easily than somebody who never worked, because they can prove they're not gonna become a public charge. So there are things we need to tell our clients if they're working, um, and that there are two things they should never do. One is they shouldn't buy or use false papers. And if they are, you should tell them to stop. And if they are, and they qualify to get a VAWA self-petition, or a U visa and legal work authorization, they can just substitute the correct one for the wrong one and move on with their lives. But if they hold themselves out as a US citizen for purposes of getting employment, they may never be able to get any help under immigration law without a super smart immigration lawyer who's very, very good and very lucky. So it's very hard. And so you want to encourage your clients not to do, you want to inform them what those laws say. So, transitional housing, go back to that. So, what we ended up doing is to prove, to prove that the victim um, could actually have, uh, have in income to meet that requirement. Literally, what I used to do is Xerox the $20 bill she was paid when she house cleaned, circle the identification numbers and show the transitional housing program that they all had different serial numbers and that she actually had income. That was in a, a, a DC where she couldn't have a bank account. If she can have a bank account, then you can show the bank account statements and the money going up. How else might you prove that she has income or some kind of income? What else What else might provide income? Yeah? Ask for a receipt. You can ask for a receipt from? Oh, uh, from their employer, some kind of statement from their employer. That might be a little hard to get under these circumstances, but yeah. What else? Pardon? Utility that's showing that she's actually paying money, utility bills. That might be a way to prove that you know she's actually paying these bills. How else might she prove that there's some, where, where might her sources of income come from? Pardon? She might get benefits for her kids. What else? So we got, she's working potentially under the table. She might get benefits, yeah. Child support. Whether or not it's paid, by the way. You have a child support order. You come in and say the child support order, this is the money I'm going to get it. Because she can't control whether he's actually going to pay it on time. That's one way. And sometimes she may be working and she has a child support order. It's just more way of showing that there's potential income coming in. Any other ideas? Pardon? No. Schools wouldn't work. <laughs> The main one is that she might have family members that are supporting her or helping support her, or she may, so there may be other ways. But the point is, is she, it is open to people that are undocumented, and the challenge for us is to help her document some kind of an economic income stream that will allow her to get, get in to be accepted to the program. Okay, she can get, she can obtain certain legal services from any agency without any res without restriction based on immigration status, if, she's a, if she can show that she's victimized, 
victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, or any U visa crime, and we'll be getting to that. Um, she can get custody and child support. I've won hundreds of custody orders on behalf of undocumented immigrant women, even when their husbands are, or the fathers US citizens and lawful permanent residents. I'm assuming, Paula, you've done the same. Right. There's nothing about immigration status that should affect her ability to get custody, although the issues can arise, and we'll be talking about that more later. And he sure tries to make that issue. Yeah. Yeah, if you're going to be representing an immigrant, uh, if you have an undocumented immigrant woman who's going to court, um, the, you should assume that the abuser is going to try to raise everything he can about her immigration status to try to undermine that family court case, the custody case. And kind of the way they do it is, I mean, the way I like to, it's, it's like if you've got a, now it's going to be hard without the microphone, but you've got a balancing act, right? So he's, he's, He's a, you, he admits, let's say he did the domestic violence crime, or there's a, a finding about domestic violence. So that would tilt the scale towards her getting custody. Well, he raises illegal immigration status, or her undocumented status, as a way to kind of balance it out. Under family laws in California and other places, that shouldn't be the factor. But it does work with individual judges, particularly judges who um, have their own personal views about whether people should be here undocumented in the United States. And that's what the abusers are banking on in these cases. <clears throat> yeah, Leslie, he'll, yes. make, he'll make statements like, well, Your Honor, there's no point in giving custody to mom because she's going to get deported. And I know this because I reported her. Um, and she's going to get deported. And then there's a risk of her taking my child out of this country. And he's a, a US citizen, Your Honor. And therefore, you should give custody to me because this is a great risk for losing our American child across the border. And they make this argument. And they make, they make the argument all the time, including when, um, when he's a US citizen and he's failed to file papers for her, and the reason she doesn't have status is because he didn't give it to her. And the problem is, is many, you need a good family lawyer like Paula and others to come in and say, no, <laughs> the reason she's in this situation is he put her there. But, that's one of the reasons we're doing these trainings and one of the reasons you want to get advocacy, good advocacy, and be sure as an advocate to connect up with a lawyer who can help her in those cases. Um, services of adult protective services, child protective services, and the like are open to everyone without regard to immigration status. Police assistance, the ability to have a perpetrator prosecuted are all the same. <clears throat> and victims have access to emergency Medicaid. So from a healthcare perspective, what is emergency Medicaid? It's somewhat limited. It is <clears throat> basically when the patient's health would be placed in serious jeopardy as a result of a serious impairment or bodily function or a dysfunction of any bodily part or organs. Can somebody tell me when, when is it most likely, there are two instances in which your client are most likely to be able to get emergency Medicaid. What's, what are they? Pregnancy. Pregnancy. Pregnancy for what? For birth and delivery. Yeah. Right. And what's the other? What? Pardon? Emergency services if he, if he breaks her arm. Right? If there's domestic violence that results in something that's going to impair a bodily part or organ, she can get her arm, her broken arm fixed, okay, under emergency Medicaid. So this is a list, and you have it in your slides, of some of the things emergency Medicaid covers. Um, in addition, though, and, and that list is quite limited, so the question becomes, where does she get prenatal care? Where does she go to get other kinds of health care that a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault may need? And the answer is, there are federally qualified health clinics. Um, at, they're across the country, there are community clinics. You can go to a government website called hrsa.gov, H-R-S-A.gov. And on the right-hand side, there's a bar where you can say, put in your zip code. And you put in your zip code, and it tells you all of the free clinics, health clinics across the country that um, victims can get. And any person who's poor, without regard to immigration status can get uh, health care assistance. 
Um, and one of the reasons that's very important, it's also important to know that all of you heard about the health care debate this summer and how much money is going to the federal government for health care. Well, what the government is doing is expanding those community um, health clinics and migrant health clubs. So there's more and more money that's going to be going into those services, which will make them more available in your communities for the victims you're working with. Um, the other thing that you can get in almost all states, including California, is if you have a crime victim, there the Victim of Crime Act pot of funding for victims is available as well. Um, these are the kinds of care that are available to uh, federal from federally qualified health centers. Um, and these are the two websites that you can find a health center and they're in your materials. Victims of Crime Act, you generally in many states have to report within 72 hours to qualify. What is, can somebody tell me what the qualifications are in California? Do you have to report a crime to qualify? For both of them? Yes. Yes? yes. yes. Okay. So that's an issue. And I raise it because people who don't file a crime report aren't going to qualify. But this requirement to cooperate and make a police report is very similar in VOCA, except as it is in the U visa. So if you're working with victims that are undocumented, who are crime victims, where they called and made a police report, or they um, <clears throat> are involved as uh, witnesses, or in, involved with the police doing investigations or prosecutions, um, or detection of cr crimes, the if you can get them to be willing to make the report within the 72 hour period, they not only will be moving themselves towards a U visa, which I'll be discussing later, but also they'll get VOCA assistance as well. And I know that's hard, particularly with sexual assault victims. <clears throat> um, so what happens is under federal law in 1996, immigration laws were changed, changed dramatically, as were welfare laws. But at the time those changes were made, the Congress designated the Attorney General of the United States and gave them the power to decide what services necessary to protect life and safety should be open to everyone without regard to immigration status. <clears throat> and they and this is the list of services that the Attorney General says should be open to everyone and that victims are immigrant victims and documented victims should not or peer persons should not be turned away from and it's services that are offered in kind at the community level not based on the income or the resources of the person who's applying so for example um, how many of you work in like rape crisis or shelter programs okay would you turn away the mayor's wife if she's abused what about the wife of the richest guy in the community? No. That's what we mean by income, not income dependent. Meaning services that are available to everyone, that it's not just for people who are poor. And so crisis counseling and intervention, adult and child protective services, victim assistance, emergency treatment of mental illness, soup kitchens, community food banks, transitional shelter, emergency shelter, nutrition programs. Those are available to anyone without regard to immigration status. <clears throat> so now, I've been talking enough. I'm gonna get you guys a little bit open up this morning. Why is <clears throat> legal status important? What if, what ha why is it important that somebody gets legal immigration status? How might their lives benefit from that? Employment, they get employment authorization. Okay, what else? It's empowerment. It's strong. It's, it's like, all right, now I'm a little bit more equal to you. Right. I mean, it's, I just think it's an incredible thing. It's true. I mean, the empowerment part of this is really, I think, the end result. I mean, women, and why are they empowered? What's changing in their life? Well, they, they sort of come from out of the shadows. They come out of the shadows. Cause, cause exactly. Yeah. So they're no longer having to hide. Yes? Disconnection from the abuser, hopefully. Right. They have more possibility of disconnection from the abuser because they're coming out of the shadows. They're able to work for themselves. They're feeling more safe um, be, because they're not afraid of what? Deportation. 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 Exactly. I mean, just the kinds of threats you heard Paula and others mention today. That, that fear of deportation is a huge tool, and that goes away. 
So she knows she's safe. She knows she can walk her children to school without anybody stopping her and asking her questions. She can get, um, if she's legally present in California, what else can she get? If she's not walking. Pardon? She can get education. She can get a driver's license. Benefits for herself. Benefits for herself. Exactly. She can visit her family back home and come back. Right. So that's a huge one, actually. Visiting her family back home and coming back. What happens is, is for a lot of immigrants, um, because of the way immigration laws are currently structured, which basically says people who left the country and came back in after generally 1996, um, if they left and came, if they stayed here all that time, their ability to get legal status, let's say through the Violence Against Women Act or the U visa protections, are much easier than if they left and came back. Because if they left and came back, they trigger more severe immigration consequences. So what that means is if her mother is dying in El Salvador and she doesn't have her visa yet, she's stuck, she can't leave and come back. And it's horrific in terms, I mean, so the ability to go and come and visit family for a lot of people is, is huge. Okay, great, I think we got most of them. Um, the other thing that is is that it gives them a path to legal permanent residency and ultimately citizenship. So in terms of being able to be stable in this country, citizenship is more stable than lawful permanent residency. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Just a quick question. Sure. Um, is it the case that for a number of these women, they were actually recruited by employers uh, to come back up into the United States and work? Do they get any special status because of that in terms of speed, speeding into citizenship? No. What happens is <clears throat> women, when you say recruited by employers, there are, you have a couple Free things. Big packing companies. Yeah, you have a couple things going on. You have human trafficking element of that, where people are going and targeting people and, you know, and bringing them over the border to come in. You also have employers. I was working on a big case, um, I, you may have heard it uh, about it, it was the Postville, the kosher meatpacking case in Iowa. That was a place where literally almost all the workers in two Guatemalan villages, who barely, many of them didn't speak English, they spoke other, they didn't speak Spanish, they spoke other indigenous languages, were brought up to work in a meatpacking plant. And what happened was, is the conditions in that plant were such that there was extortion, there were, um, there were sexual assault, physical assault, all kinds of things happening, but those workers were totally controlled. And those workers, many, 50 or 60 of those workers have now received new visas for cooperating with the um, criminal prosecutions of the meatpacking plant owners. So that's one of the things that the U visa, will, which we'll be talking about later, was designed to do. Thank you. Sure, okay. So what I'm gonna do now is go over and give you guys an overview of what the various forms of immigration relief um, are that could be helpful to an immigrant victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, or other mostly violent crimes. Um, at the top of the list, <coughs> where it says applications that can be filed with DHS, which is the Department of Homeland Security, used to be called INS, and Immigration and Naturalization Service. I'll be talking about that department and how it works a little bit probably after the break. But what, what's important to understand is the kinds of immigration relief that were designed to help immigrant victims come out of two, they were developed against, I guess you could say two different backgrounds. One of them, one of them, the VAWA self-petition, or two of them, the VAWA self-petition and the battered spouse waiver are developed come out of or developed modeled after the family law, the family immigration system. So one of the things that's important to understand is immigrant women in this country, by and large, get legal status in this country, if they get it at all, through family immigration. Men are more likely to get it through work and bring female family members along. Women do get it through work, but in much smaller numbers than men, okay? So the violence against, the VAWA self-petition, the Violence Against Women Act self-petition, and the Battered Spouse Waiver were both created to kind of deal with the problems that were arising for immigrant victims in the family immigration system. So 
The presumption is, how many of you, and I know it was a movie a long time ago, saw the movie Green Card with Depardieu? Okay. The presumption there is you marry a US citizen and you can just you know, file papers immediately and get the papers. And what happened was in 1986, um, the immigration laws changed and the Dep Congress basically told the Department of Homeland Security and the Homeland Security was happy to do it and what they do is they presume that every single marriage in this country is fraudulent until it's proven not to be. And so they created an immigration system that assumes fraud. And so what happens is if I'm married, if I'm a, uh, from the Ukraine and I come in and I marry somebody who's a US citizen, um, and let's say there's no abuse and they file papers immediately, if on the day I go for my interview with my husband to the Department of Homeland Security, I've been married one year, 11 months, and 15 days, not two years, <laughs> I get what's called a conditional green card. I get a card, first of all, it's not green. <laughs> they're pink, they're white, they keep changing the colors, but they're not green. Second, I get a card that has an expiration date two years after I received it. And for those two years, I only have conditional residency. And what I'm told is that myself and my husband have to come back to the Department of Homeland Security two years later and prove we're still married. Okay? So what does that do to battered women? It condemned them to two years at least in this relationship. So in 1990, um, this was the first piece of legislation that helped battered immigrants. Congress said no. They said if you are, if he filed papers for you, you have a conditional green card, you've proven you deserve that, you can come in and show evidence of a valid marriage and evidence of battering or extreme cruelty, and we will give you your full green card now, and you don't have, you don't have to wait, and you don't even have, he can, you, he can do it in secret and he doesn't even know about it, so that you can get it safely. Those are the easiest cases if you have a client who shows you a two-year green card, any advocate can help her fill out the forms and do it if you can document the domestic violence. And my recommendation is, is that you check in with an immigration lawyer to make sure there's not other problems in her case. But generally speaking, those are cases that you you can all help her with. It's not hard. The second thing is, is Congress thought back in 89 or 90, they solved the problem. And then they realized, we knew, but they realized that that only helped people whose husbands had filed papers initially, and that the 72% that never filed were still stuck. So in 1994, Congress created the Battered Spouse Waiver. No, I'm sorry, Congress created VAWA Self-Petition, which was a means by which an immigrant woman who was married to a US citizen or lawful permanent resident, or a child who had a US citizen or lawful permanent resident parent who was abused, could file for their own immigration papers. <clears throat> um, and I'm gonna to talk to you about that in detail in just a moment. In 19, but after that was done, we realized, for and, and in 2000, Congress created something called the Crime Victim Visa, because we realized that it was great if you could help somebody marry to a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident, but there were lots of people who were victims of spousal or intimate partner violence or who were victims of rape or sexual assault or a variety of other crimes that had still had no access to immigration status and had no way to collaborate or cooperate with law enforcement in the prosecution of perpetrators. And so what happened was, is they, taking on kind of the human rights function, they decided to create some visa, crime victim visas, two visas, the U visa and the T visa, that were designed to help victims of crime and human trafficking in this country. So those are, it takes more of a human rights approach or humanitarian approach um, to providing protection to victims. So, and that, that there were two equal reasons why Congress did it. One is they wanted to help victims, but two, at the same time, they also wanted to foster the ability of victims to come forward and cooperate in criminal det in detection, investigation, and prosecution of criminal cases. Okay, so there were two equal reasons, and I'll go into the U visa later. And then finally, I'll just say, I'll show you a slide in a minute. They're also, they also understood that, as in the example Paula gave us, 
that he's, you know, the likelihood he's going to call up and try to report her is great, and that some victims will end up before an immigration judge in deportation proceedings. And if they're in deportation proceedings, there's two remedies available to people whose abusers are U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents to get relief from deportation in the deportation proceeding. Okay. So, I'm now going to turn to what are the requirements of the VAWA self-petition, okay? Um, yes? Sorry, this is that same. Along that line, if during the process of the batter alleging that um, A, she's undocumented, and B, that she is also um, a perpetrator of a crime, whether it's mutual abuse or drug trafficking or something, is she at more, she's at more risk? Right. Any... That's actually a very good question. I'll be talking, I'll be, I'll be explaining more about why this really happens in a little bit. But one of the things that's super, super important, if you walk out of this room with anything today, and this is only the only thing that's good enough for me, and that is any victim of domestic violence or sexual assault or human trafficking who ends up with a criminal conviction herself, is the case becomes very much more difficult problematic, and in many cases will cut her off from relief. That is not to say that somebody who walks into your office who had a crime for shoplifting baby food when she was fleeing and took, took a plea because she didn't get the right counsel and because she was trying to feed her kids when fleeing her abuser is totally cut off. But it means you need a really good lawyer and there's a, the process of getting access to relief is greater, okay? And so, one of the things, how many of you that are doing domestic violence or sexual assault work regularly work with your local police and prosecution, of, you know, local police? Okay. And you do that because you are working with victims whose abusers may be, per may be um, uh, being prosecuted or that there's a crime against, a case against the abuser. Those relationships are super, super important. And so under federal law, for example, there shouldn't be dual arrests anymore. Police for years have been trained to do primary perpetrator determinations and those kinds of things. In cases of immigrant victims, it's even more important because if they make a mistake and she, if they, if they think there's, they're both perpetrators and they bring her into the, they book her and bring her into the jail. Today, under U.S. law, or under, actually under U.S. law and under an agreement between the federal government and the county of Los Angeles, those fingerprints are sent to DHS. And so what happens is she's immediately reported. So if the abuser can get the police officer to arrest both of them, he can accomplish his threat of deportation very easily, or at least put her in a more precarious position, which is why working with law enforcement is really important. So if you have a client who's been arrested, um, you want to try to either try to make that case go away, convince the officer or the DA that they should drop the case, or you need to get her a good lawyer and she's got to fight it like a homicide case. She's got to win. And if she can, it's better. And I've litigated a whole bunch of cases like that where I was defending against protection orders or, you know, working to try to make these cases go away. So that's, it's super important that they not have convictions if, if at all possible. It's not possible to, if they have convictions, but it's hard. Okay. And I'll, you'll see where that all plays into the picture as we go on today. Sure. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to add, I work at the prosecutor's office and the victim's advocate, and I've noticed when there's two arrests that the um, filing prosecutor tends to reject those cases. So then they don't file charges on either party. Okay. In most cases. So what you're saying is in Long Beach, are you, what, where are you, which prosecutor's office? At Long Beach. Long Beach. So I'm the um, advocate. Right. She's the advocate. So what she's noticed is, is that the filing prosecutors, when there's two arrests, tend to just not go forward with either of them. Great. I mean, that's that's fine, except that she just has to wait to be battered again. Yes? <laughs> Pardon? Oh, just to add to that, what they do is uh, cases that I get that are dual arrest, they're usually they just they're rejected under what's called mutual combat. The officer can't determine who's the primary aggressor, so sometimes the solution is to arrest both people right. and take care of the immediate problem. Whether it's a final case where the person gets convicted, prosecuted, whatever, that's a whole other ball game. Right. But for us, what we're, we're the control officer on the scene, you can't determine who's who right. and who's who, that takes place. Right. Okay. 
Right, and that's why, again, a good advocate, that's, that's true. I mean, the idea is you're supposed to be determined, but sometimes they can't. And what we've seen, I, I, I can say that the example I'm giving isn't coming from Southern California. I'm gonna give you an example. Because um, it actually came from Northern California. But the, one of the, some of the key ways in, in, that we see this happening, there's a, a case of an Indonesian woman who, who got, somehow picked up the phone and dialed 911, or, or somebody called for her, I can't remember, one of the children called or something. Police officers arrive on the scene. She doesn't speak any English and they don't get an interpreter. And the abuser speaks English and convinces them to arrest her or to arrest both, you know, doesn't usually convince them to arrest both of them because he doesn't want to be arrested. But sometimes what triggers her arrest in these is sometimes they can't make the determination because they can't speak with her. And that's why we have language access laws. And that's why, you know, police are trained and other people are trained to try to bring in interpreters as needed why interpreters are so important in these cases because a lot of the things I'm seeing nationally where victims end up getting arrested it often is triggered it also relates to language access that the smaller departments that aren't getting the access the, the certified interpreter and that are using people on the scene who may be the kid or the sister-in-law or whatever it's a problem and it's something that you know, we all need to kind of deal with it as the system, in the system as we're actors and trying to make sure that as soon as possible and as early as possible in the process we can get language access for both parties. You can't tell who's the victim and perpetrator sometimes if you can't speak to them in their languages. Okay, um, back to, and as to the self-petition, in order to qualify, you have to show that you're battered or subject to extreme cruelty, we'll get to that definition in a minute by a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident spouse or, or former spouse, parent, including step-parents. Under immigration law, step-parent is the same as a parent in terms of eligibility for the child. Um, or there are elder abuse cases in which the perpetrator is the adult over 21-year-old son or daughter citizen who could be filing papers for their parent. <clears throat> You have to show that there was some period of residence between, you know, the, uh, of the perpetrator with the victim. Could be just visitation would be sufficient. And you have to show that the person has good moral character. And the main form of evidence on good moral character that the Department of Homeland Security looks for is criminal records. So that's where in the self-petitioning process having been convicted of a crime comes in. And finally, you have to show that it's a good faith marriage, which basically means if someone is, uh, if you're in love with each, you know, there's, there's a, a courtship and, and they're living together and they're married and, and things like that, and then they did, or they're living together and um, it's a real relationship, the victim believes when she goes in that she's expecting to spend her life with him. And if one of the reasons they decided to get married is so that she could get legal status, that's okay, that's not fraudulent. And, but what's fraudulent if, is if the only reason, there is no real relationship, no real intent on any party to really be in a marriage together, and then they get married, then you've got potential marriage, you've got marriage fraud. What do you think the best evidence of a valid marriage is in a child? Right, and I can't tell you, almost every case I worked on where they had kids, my clients would tell me that I'm afraid to go forward. He says I only married him for the papers. And I'm looking at, you know, <laughs> kids. And, you know, but, but the abuser keeps saying to her, you only married him for the papers, I'm gonna tell them it's fraudulent, you're gonna get in trouble. Oh, and, and so it's not true. If they have kids, you don't have to worry about it at all. If they don't have kids, then it may be a case where you're gonna have to do some more work to prove that it's a valid marriage. Um, this is the list that the Department of Homeland Security uses in determining extreme cruelty. This is what they've been trained on, and this is what they're using, to, because what's happening is, is immigration relief has a prevention element in which they give, it's available to people before there's been the first actual violent act, act before there's been the first assault. And it was designed to cover more than what is available in state protection orders. Does this list kind of sort of, does this list kind of sort of look like something somebody's seen before? What is it? 
It's pardon? It's violence. It's violence. But what does this remind people of a Power tool? Controller. Power controller. Exactly right. This is research has found that when looking at the dynamics of domestic violence and immigrant relationships that the, the power and control will, and evidence and an affidavit from the victim about how all these things are happening can put together a case of extreme cruelty. The way, and, and that there are, and that's the way that you should be doing it, is reviewing this with your client. And just as you get information about this assault and that assault and et cetera, you wanna collect the information about these dynamics to prove extreme cruelty so that she can get immigration protection through the Violence Against Women Act perhaps sooner than having to wait for the first um, incident of, of abuse, of physical abuse. And then there are, this is again, some of the other information that they use in determining, and they're looking for these in her story. Um, once a victim files the VAWA self petition, what happens is she, the first thing that happens is she'll get a prima facie case determination, and that case, she'll get a, a letter back from the Department of Homeland Security that, that, that says basically they believe her case is valid. And if they believe she has a valid case under California law, that gives her access, that means she's legally present, and she can get a driver's license, and she can act, get access to state-funded benefits. She will not have work authorization yet. She will not have legal work authorization at this time. She gets legal work authorization once her case is approved, and she gets formal um, <clears throat> deferred action, or basically, she gets formal protection against deportation once her case is approved. Um, and then, whether or not she can, when she can apply for lawful permanent residency depends on who her abuser is. So if the abuser is a US citizen, they can immediately apply for lawful permanent residency. If her abuser is, is a lawful permanent resident, Victims have to wait seven years before they can actually apply. During that time, they won't be deported, they'll have work authorization, they'll be able to get some benefits, but they can't travel to see their mother. They can't leave the country, okay? They basically are in line waiting with everyone else for that paper. Okay, now I'm gonna shift over <clears throat> before the break and just go over with you an outline of what the other form of, the major other form of relief is that you'll be having, you'll be working with victims on. And that is um, the crime victim visa, which is a U visa. Um, we tried in the negotiations with Congress to get a V visa purposefully, because they understood that if you're really gonna detect crime and have prosecutions and investigations be successful and move forward, you have to offer protection to the victim as soon as possible in the process. And so the statute clearly says at the point of investigation and prosecution, the Department of Homeland Security regulations confirmed congressional intent, relying on congressional intent, extended protection back to the point of detection. And so, and that the idea was that a victim could get that help early on in the process, and then she would be by regulation required to, to give ongoing cooperation unless and until that cooperation, unless and until that cooperation became too dangerous for her, or for other reasons where she could show, she could still go forward and have her visa if she could show that she didn't unreasonably refuse to cooperate. So there's not a mandate for cooperation, they're supposed to cooperate, but where that cooperation would be unreasonable, in her case, she can still have her visa without having to fully cooperate. Um, and I'll explain as a, after the break more details about that and how it was designed and how it actually works. She has to show that she has been, is being, or is likely to be helpful in a criminal investigation or prosecution. It could be, um, and what has been means Someone with a case that was filed five years ago where they testified and they were cooperative and is only now learning about the visa would qualify for a certification because they've already shown in the past that they were cooperative with the police or with prosecutors. It could be a case that's already been tried in which there was a conviction, in which there was no conviction. It could be a rape case that's still open because they can't ID the perpetrator. 
but she had the forensic test and is willing to give evidence and has been, but they've never been able to identify him or or um, or, pick, or or actually make an arrest. The key here is when we talked about the Violence Against Women Act immigration provisions, you had to show physical or emotional abuse, but there was no quantity of harm required. Here, there's a quantity of harm required. She could be a victim of criminal activity, get a certification, and fail. If she can't show that that criminal activity caused her substantial physical or emotional injury, ultimately she won't get the U visa. The police under the regulations are not required to determine what her harm is. That's her job to prove. If the police on the scene, though, see that she had a black eye, it's good advocacy to encourage the police to write down that they saw that she had a black eye. That's helpful. But it's her responsibility to prove the um, substantial physical or emotional injury as a result of the victimization. And the crime has to have occurred in the US. So yesterday there were some people in my workshop from San Diego. You can imagine that there are police times when they grow, she goes across the border, the crime helps her, her, happens there, then they come back into the United States. You have to show a connection. Some part of the crime has to have happened in the US. And you'll notice, I was talking about domestic violence, essentially, on the, on the self-petition. But here, we're talking about a range of criminal activities. And the way I like to think about how this list is organized, many of these are violent crimes. There's a whole range of physical assault and sexual assault and violence against women related crimes on the list. There's also a whole range of kidnapping, hostage, holding hostage, blackmail, I mean, um, kidnapping, abduction, peonage, those kind of crimes that you imagine are occurring in, let's say, the meatpacking plant or in some kind of a sweatshop or, you know, it could also happen in domestic violence cases or other cases as well. Um, there's manslaughter, murder, felonious assault, assault. And when people look at this and they see manslaughter and their murder, who's the victim? You know, the victim is the person, theoretically, the victim's the one that is dead, okay? But under DHS regulations, the victim in these cases could be the spouse of, of the person who was murdered or the child of the person who was murdered, who had information and was cooperating with, with police. And it also includes kind of the range of obstruction of justice kind of crimes, perjury, obstruction of justice, faults in, you know, uh, are included so that there, as a way to get at some of those other crimes that are around coercing witnesses and getting, trying to convince the witness or endangering a witness who might, or someone who might be a witness in a criminal case. And then it also includes attempt or conspiracy to commit these crimes and any similar activity. And what any similar activity means is this was entitled to be a national law. So what happens is, is that if, um, if, if the named crime in your statute isn't the one exactly on the list, but has the same elements, then it's covered under the UBS crimes. So the last slide I think we'll do before we take a break is the U visa process. So the first part of the U visa is no U visa can go forward unless you have a certification from a law enforcement official a prosecutor, a, uh, a, a judge. Um, it can also be a child abuse state worker. It could be an adult protective services worker. It could be the Department of Labor in California. It could be the EEOC. Um, those are the general ones you'd see. Any of them can do certification. It was conceived, of the reason that list was put in there, and, and DHS itself can also certify. And the reason that this was created and was brought, was meant, intended to be brought so that there'd be a range of places that were the first entry point for the victim that she could get certification. And I know in some communities, for example, if the, the only prosecutor certify or only police certify, that's not what was intended. It was intended to be whoever is working with the victim and whoever the victim is cooperating with to have them the power to do that. But it also means that if you can't get a certification one, you could try for another. So we have to, from an advocacy perspective, we want to be creative about that and try to make sure that victims get protection as soon as possible in the process. Because once she has a U visa, as we were talking about earlier, 
and she feels safe and she's not afraid of deportation anymore, then that victim who may be unwilling to cooperate will feel, feel freer and be able to cooperate even though she was saying she didn't want to in the beginning. So there's, or, or that she said she did and then she changed her mind, which is normally what happens. So she gets a certification, she files her application in which she has to prove not only substantial physical or emotional injury, she has to put in a whole affidavit about the crime and what happened, but she also prove, has to prove, she has to put forth her entire criminal history, if she has any. She has to prove that she's not a terrorist. She has to get fingerprints. They run her through all these checks, federal databases. And she has to prove that she's, you know, that she's a victim and then whatever history she has that's criminal, DHS has to decide. She has an opportunity to ask for a waiver, but she has to convince them that she deserves it. And that will depend on what her crime was and what this crime victim is, and it depends on a lot of factors. And what happens is, is when she gets the visa, if she wins her case and gets a visa, she gets a four-year temporary visa. A lot of people think, I'm not going to sign that certification because I don't want to give her citizenship. Well, you're a long way from citizenship when you get the U visa certificate, certificate the U visa. A U visa gives you four years to be temporary, temporarily in the United States, and only a subset of those people will qualify for lawful permanent residency, and I'll talk about those details after the break. Um, and I'll stop there and we'll take Okay, so we'll take five minutes, anybody who... When you look at this list of what she has to prove, how does this differ from the VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, the self-petition? The self-petition, she has to be married to a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. What's the difference here? Who, what kinds of victims might be benefit from this? Anybody? Is that a hand? Yes. Victims with children. Victims with children, meaning where the they're not married to the father of the children, but they're domestic violence victims from the intimate partner where there's no marriage. Absolutely. What else? Everybody seems to have gravitated over this side. Undocumented batterers. Right, when the batterer is undocumented. Exactly. So that it could be a batter who's undocumented. It could be a batter who's a diplomat. It could be a, a, a it could be a domestic violence case where the batter is a um, is here on a work visa. It might be teaching at the Long Beach State College. Okay, those are people who's where the victim. There's the relationship between the victim and the batter, whether it's marriage or not, doesn't matter. And it could be and the the batter, the perpetrator. It could be a non-domestic violence case. It could be sexual assault in the workplace. It could be sexual assault on campus. It could be um, child abuse unrelated to, not by a family member, okay? So these are, these are cr any crime victim, relationship doesn't matter, immigration status of the perpetrator doesn't matter, okay? So, yes? Interesting. Good question. The U visa, in terms of question? the question was, law enforcement. What are they legally responsible to do where there's law enforcement liability if they don't? Nothing. This is not. There's no. Yeah. Nobody can sue you. For not signing a certification, but they can make your boss look really bad if the case is really bad. You know, so it's 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 an issue about you know the chief of police. Does he want to really be standing there with a murder case where there's no certification and the victims won't testify? And and the point here is, Congress wasn't looking. They were we were trying to create carrots, not sticks. We were trying to create um, an opportunity for to, a tool for law enforcement and for advocates to help victims come forward. And that that tool was co-equal because it was equally a way to get people, help people be safe and because they, they're not afraid of deportation in the hope that they would then be able to volunteer to continue cooperating. And a way for law enforcement to better detect the crimes, detect and, and investigate and prosecute. Yeah. So the victim has to 
has to meet all the requirements under the victim requirements. In addition, no, 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 she has to meet all of the requirements. And that's, this slide actually talks about which of the requirements law enforcement needs to pay attention to or think about as they do a certification. And this, this slide talks about what the law enforcement certification form, the kinds of things they're actually looking for. So for example, they have to identify the victim, right? It's, it could be the crime, but you know, who's the victim? Who is the person harmed? So it's, you know, the identity of the victim is one of the things the law enforcement official would look at and have to put on the form. And I do recommend, one of the ways we're, for, to those of you that are advocates and attorneys in it, I did, two weeks ago I was doing a, a, a Northern California training with the lead certifier for the city of San Francisco on the U visa certifications. And what he told me, and I think it's similar to our discussion earlier today, that it's much easier for law enforcement if the, the victim advocate and the victim actually fill out the form and all of that, because she's gonna be able to say, here's the, the, you know, she's coming in to get a certification and she can say, I called 911, officer so-and-so, you know, officer X came, I spoke with him, I identified the perpetrator, I've gone down to the police station, whatever she's done to be cooperative, her evidence of cooperation, there's a space on the form to put that, um, so that you want to identify the victim. If the officer, if the, the police officer who, who gets the certification will look at their records, there may be a police report in which the police officer on the scene saw a broken bone or a broken nose or saw the house in disarray. Whatever they saw in terms of physical injuries, it's helpful to note, but it is not the police department or officer's responsibility to prove substantial injury. That's her independent responsibility. So. It's important to note that uh, officers filling out the forms um, can fill out the forms even if they didn't see physical injury because she, they need to know that she will have to prove that independently, physical or emotional injury. They would need to put information they have or you would draft the form and put information you have about helpfulness, what she's done, I called 911, I called the police, I spoke to the officers on the scene. That should be sufficient. There is a mechanism um, at the end of the form it says that should a victim, there's two mechanisms set up to address the issue of when a victim starts cooperating and then decides she can't, okay? And they set those up so that officers would feel comfortable doing certifications earlier, knowing that there's processes in place, there's like actually three things in place that come after that that address the issue of non-cooperation. The first is just getting the certification doesn't guarantee that she's gonna get the U visa. In order to get the U visa, she needs a certification, plus she has to prove to DHS that she was really the victim of this crime and it occurred, and that she had substantial physical or emotional injury, and her entire criminal history. And so they're all, and so if in fact an, an undocumented immigrant victim is coming forward and there's some criminal history or whatever there, there's a real risk of deportation to her, of making this up and trying to, you know, if there's, so there's, those are fraud protections. In addition, on the actual certification form at the end, it informs the officer in the instruction sheet that should the victim unreasonably refuse to cooperate in the future, the, the officer can provide that information to the Department of Homeland Security. And what will happen is, if it's a real serious case, let's say there was a real, and this happens actually, let's say there's you know some lawyer out there charging $3,000 a case to get certifications and sign people up for U visas and it's all fraud. You know, which happens, they, they, one of the reasons the Department of Homeland Security has a single unit that works on all these cases because it gives them a better ability to detect fraud. Because all they're doing day in and day out are these crime victim visas, VAWA cases, and trafficking victim visas. So what happens is, at the, the other thing that happens is at the end of the process, so a victim might, reasonably refuse to cooperate, it might be that the perpetrator is threatened to kill her family members or threatened to kill her and she's afraid and you might have obstruction of justice going on, you might have all kinds of things. And Congress knew that was possible. So they created the ability of the law enforcement officer to communicate back with DHS later on saying, you know, I think we made a mistake here or um, she's no longer cooperating. Then when she comes to get her lawful permanent residency based on the crime victim visa, she needs to prove that she was, didn't unreasonably refuse to cooperate. 
which is another check. So if the law enforcement officer provided evidence and three years later she comes in and says, I cooperated fully, but there's evidence they provided that it's not true, she has to explain to the Department of Homeland Security and they have to adjudicate whether they believe her lack of cooperation was uh, not unreasonable. These double negative things are weird, but that's how the statute's written. So that's another check and balance in the system. Okay, so they have to talk about what information they have on helpfulness. They have to talk about, they have to identify in the form any family members involved or implicated in the crime. And the reason they do that is the statute, both the Violence Against Women Act and the U visas, prohibit the victim from including as a dependent in her application who gets the visa, the perpetrator. And so law enforcement is a good source to identify who is the perpetrator in this particular case so that the perpetrator can't coerce her to including him in the application and get a benefit from a crime he perpetrated. Okay. Um, and that the victim additionally has to prove those other things. So what happens is, is after they get a three-year visa, a four-year visa, and after three years, they qualify to apply for lawful permanent residency. And in order to prove lawful, get lawful permanent residency, they have to do two things. One, they have to prove their cooperation or prove to the Department of Homeland Security that they didn't unreasonably refuse to cooperate. And even if they prove that, they're not guaranteed lawful permanent residency. They have to prove one of three other things. And they have to prove humanitarian need, public interest, or family unity. And I'm going to give you examples of what this legal jargon means. <laughs> humanitarian need. Let's say, I actually had a case like this. They were both from uh, Chiquilagua in El Salvador. And he assaulted her with a machete, broke her arm. She, she, she called and made a police report, cooperated, identified him, and he was convicted. While he's in jail at, during his conviction, he will be identified by DHS, and at the end of his sentence, he will be removed to El Salvador. She testified at the trial, she was the main witness, she got the help get the conviction, and now he's in El Salvador in her home village waiting for her. If she's deported, he could kill her, he could retaliate. That's humanitarian need. That's an example of humanitarian need. Family unity. Um, how many of you have worked with young people who came to the United States as little children, undocumented, um, with a family, and have grown up here, et cetera? Yeah, so I see some nods and hands, okay. Family unity. One of the things we know about immigrant families in this country is about 85% of them are what we call mixed families. They're mixed immigration status families. And what that means is there may be couple of US citizen siblings. There may be a US citizen spouse. There may be um, an undocumented mother and a cousin or uncle living in the family that has temporary protected status or some other status. It may, somebody who can show that they have a number of relatives or they live in a family with the other US citizens and lawful permanent residents in this country can show that they need to stay here for purposes of family unity and the Department of Homeland Security can give them lawful permanent residency to so move them from U visa to lawful permanent residency, where they can show cooperation, not unreasonably refusing to cooperate, plus family unity. The final one is public interest. And the way we discuss public interest when Congress was writing this legislation is they wanted a category where the crime victim who went through a lot to prosecute this case, to be involved in it, who really risk danger, who you know, who they feel like, you know, she's gone through enough. We we want to exercise our discretion to give her lawful permanent residency. That's public interest. And I, the example I think of is serial rape case in the community, where you have all kinds, a number of victims, and it happens to be the undocumented victim who actually can identify the perpetrator. And she went through it and she testified and she got the visa and everything else. And DHS has the discretion to say, okay, you know, we're going to give her lawful permanent residency because it's in the public interest to do so. Um, okay. 
earlier I was talking about, so what happens is when you fill out a U visa application or when you fill out a VAWA case, there are certain things that the victim could have in her history that may trigger um, making sure that you really get to a good immigration attorney who knows what they're doing for the case. A lot of these cases, victim advocates and attorneys can work together and should work together. Many of the Violence Against Women Act self petitioning cases, um, advocates can really do on their own if they are screening for problems. And this list that I've included here, I know it's really tiny up there, are screening for issues that if they exist in the problem, in the case, so for example, I know I have a number of folks here from formerly from Child Protective Services. If Child Protective Services had a case against the mother and the, um, the father, and the father was the perpetrator and the mother was, let's say, charged with failure or convicted of failure to protect, that could be a problem in the immigration case, which would mean she needs an attorney. Same thing with anything related to drugs, same thing with criminal convictions, et cetera. So this is a screening list that if you, you should find advocates are often the ones in the best position to get this information from their clients. So it's one thing you want to screen to try to sort which cases really you need an attorney and which cases you may be able to do yourselves with um, consultation from an attorney and review. This list was developed to help you compare. Some victims qualify for VAWA self-petitioning and the U visa. And so these highlight the differences between the two um, and are a good tool for you to use as you work with clients. Okay. Um, what I want to now shift over to, I have about a half hour left and a lot to cover. Um, I'm going to go very quickly through some brand new policies at the Department of Homeland Security that will highlight why U visa certification is so important and how to best do cases for immigrant victims in a way that we can be sure that we're helping them and be safe. So what's happened is, is that at a time years ago when I was doing this work, I'm sure that abusers were threatening to call Department of Homeland Security or INS at the time. But no real problems happened from it because the funding at the Department of Homeland Security levels were such that they had to spend their enforcement dollars on what they considered priority, criminal aliens, worksite enforcement, et cetera. There have been a huge amount of money going into the Department of Homeland Security. So now you have a situation where the abuser calls and there's somebody sitting by the phone that needs something to do. And so what happens is they go out. And you know, somebody calls and says, you know, come to my house and pick up my wife, and they do it. They're not supposed to do it. There are vowel confidentiality protections that say they're not supposed to be relying on abuser provided information. But they do it. And so what happens is, is those types of calls and increased enforcement, particularly where law enforcement and DHS are cooperating, really undermine community policing and make it a lot harder for victims to come forward. <clears throat> so one of the things, when, it, when I was practicing, one of the things we used to do is a victim would come through, the first thing we do is get a protection order, and then we worry about immigration. And we've done this for years. It all needs to change now, and I'll show you why. Because now what happens is, A, we know when the abusers call, they're more likely to come out and do something. You know, DHS is more likely to respond. And B, there are new regulations from the Department of Homeland Security policies that came out in August of 2010 that basically say a victim who is eligible or has filed a case for a VAWA, a T, a U, a work visa application, or a family visa application that, has a, that DHS determines is a legitimate case is protected from detention and removal. Detention and deportation. If they think you have a legitimate case, the Department of Homeland Security has recently said they'll check their systems. If there's a case, you can't detain that victim or that person, because it could be somebody from a family visa petition. And if the judge and if the judge has the case, they will close the case without prejudice. Okay? So it's really important because the moment it's it, the, the 
the way we handle the cases in terms of safety are different, can be different. Because if now if somebody comes to me on a protection order and I know she's a VAWA self-petitioner or a Yugi's a victim, I'm gonna want that immigration case started first, so if possible, at least initially, because then when I serve the abuser with the protection order case and he gets mad and he calls DHS, there's already a protection in that system for her. And I've got, you know, she's safer. Or if he's mad because I'm trying to get custody and he tries to retaliate, she's protected against him. And that's really different. Yes? Which agency then would be the best referral for the woman at that time? Would it be through legal aid or through the immigration services? I'm looking at... Well, well uh, unfortunately, all I can tell you is that our immigration unit is so swamped that they have periods of time where they'll just put out the word that they're not taking new cases. Um, are they right now taking new cases? I mean, I have a question. Your immigration unit, because this is one of the things that is important, is if it's, let's say, a VAWA self-petition, you actually don't need the immigration unit to take the case. You could work up the case yourself. If you go to our website, and it's www.iwp.legalmomentum.org, and I'll say that again a couple more times. <laughs> it's IWP, Immigrant Women Program, dot legalmomentum, all one word, dot org. And that's a library of materials that have all been, uh, the, the ones up right now, they're divided in two pieces. They're government approved documents, and then there are other documents we created that we haven't asked the government necessarily to approve. Um, the government approved documents are all up, and they include checklists, evidence checklists, that you can use for protection orders, for U visas, for VAWA, um, for benefits, of the kinds of information you have to collect. Um, and so ultimately, what you want to do is you'll need to check in potentially with somebody who has immigration expertise so that you can make sure that you're not, that this is a legitimate case and you've, you've seen it correctly. But on the, on the VAWA forms, there's actually a form where you put in your name and information as the advocate, non-lawyer who's helped her. And that's important to do because it means that the Department of Homeland Security will communicate with you, that there's safe communication with you and they know that you're not like the abuser's sister or something, okay? But if both of these types of proceedings, you have to be aware of those red flags. Correct. The red, you have to be aware of red flags before, before, you, before you do you anything. Before you send anything in there. Absolutely. You want to go through, and if you have red flags, that's when you need an attorney, and you'll have to get an immigration attorney and figure you know, that out. Um, we're hoping, actually, we've been talking to some law firms in, uh, in in state of California to try to help with the backlog issue and help with immigrant victims in rural areas to partner <coughs> advocates and lawyers and law firms to do some of these cases we are beginning we've got law firms to agree but we haven't moved the project but hopefully in the, within the next year we'll be starting that with California Coalition California Partnership to End Domestic Violence and the Cal Casa the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault and be able to help in California on some of those issues. It's a national model we'd like to eventually take nationally. Yeah. On the VAWA issue, is there still the two-year window relating to the divorce? Yes. And how is that impacted by change, like in terms of filing for the VAWA first, before you may have started the filing? Right. What happens is, is there's a two-year from, you yeah, right, exactly. So if, in fact, you file it before you file divorce, that, that you have to file for a VAWA self-petition within two years of divorce. So if you have a family case that you're initiating, you could start the VAWA at least before. You just want to get a case filed. It doesn't have to be adjudicated. You want something in the system so she has what's called an A number. It's her case number. And one of the things you're going to want to tell your clients is they need to carry that number with her. They have to memorize it something so that if immigration enforcement stops them when they're driving their car, they can tell them they have a case and that, you know, that they're a victim. Okay, so the other issue I want to raise is there's another policy out of the Department of Homeland Security that came out about a year and a half, two years ago, in which they have agreed that they're not going to detain primary and sole caretakers of children and breastfeeding women. And this is independent of the having a case in the system. And what's important about that is that one of the things we saw over the last five, three or four years with increased immigration enforcement is that you know you have a work site enforcement action, DHS comes in, everybody's scared, 
And the victims, when they're asked, do you have children, what do you think they say? If they have undocumented children, what do you think they say? No. no. And what we learned in some of these worksite, rape, worksite enforcement cases was the women who denied having undocumented children got deported, and the women who said they had undocumented children got released on ankle bracelets or some other kind of detention and were able to be here to, pro to be able to go forward with their visa cases. It's counterintuitive. I understand why an undocumented immigrant victim who's being you know, arrested for immigration violations wouldn't want to admit she has children. But if she fails to admit she has children, she will be detained and have less access to you as advocates and attorneys. So it's really, really, really important that when working with clients and you know they have children, if they're undocumented, tell them to keep telling DHS when they stop them that they have children and that they have to pick them up from the school and you know all of that, that they're the primary caretakers. Because DHS has policies in place that has agreed, they have agreed that they don't want to be detaining mothers with kids, okay? Um, which I, we see as a real victory, but it now turns on people being willing to work with victims and get them over the fear of identifying that. Okay. Okay. Vala confidentiality. I mentioned, I'm just going to go over this very briefly. I was talking about abusers making calls to DHS. And one of the things that the law, this law has been in place since 1996, it bars the Department of Homeland Security from relying on tips or any information coming from an abuser, a trafficker, or a perpetrator. So again, one of the reasons you want to cooperate with law enforcement or you want to encourage your clients to cooperate with law enforcement is if she gets a U visa certification and she is cooperative, she has evidence that she can show DHS that the person they're relying on is a perpetrator. And that's one of the things, one of the advantages of supporting her through that process of cooperation with the UBISA. In addition, the cases that are filed with the Department of Homeland Security are sealed. No one can get information about the, even the existence of that case. The old, there are some limited exceptions, and one of them is if it's the rape case that's going to trial. At that point, the existence of that case may become information that's available, but by that time, if she's got an early certification, then she'll have lawful permit, she'll have uh, her U visa, she'll be working, she'll be less safe, she'll, she'll be more safe, more stable. And so the harm to her of the abuser knowing about the case is much less. But in the process of the criminal prosecution, it may come out. And then most importantly, for as importantly for you all, there are locational prohibitions. DHS is prohibited from doing enforcement actions at particular locations. And that includes a shelter, a rape crisis center, a family, um, a family justice center, a supervised visitation center, nonprofit community-based organizations, and courthouses where there's a criminal or civil case of any kind going on with regard, or a custody case uh, involving a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, or a UBS crime. Um, I am going to just give you a very brief overview of some additional public benefits victims can get in California, and then I'm going to turn to some of the family law issues that I'm going to be ending the presentation on. And so I talked earlier, I started the presentation about, uh, with information about what undocumented immigrant victims can get, even if they're undocumented, even if they don't apply for immigration relief. One of the other reasons that will help encourage victims in California to come forward and do, should help, um, to do um, a VAWA self-petition case or be cooperative and do a U, with law enforcement and do a U visa case, is that in California and in many other, about 22 other states, coming forward and beginning the VAWA case and the U visa case and getting a certification from DHS that you, they believe you filed a valid case gives you access to public benefits, state and federally funded public benefits. And so there are 
And what happens is, is the VAWA victims, the victims filing the VAWA self-petition, become what this slide calls qualified immigrants. And those qualified immigrants are entitled to public benefits, including post-secondary educational grants and loans, uh, public and assisted housing, um, uh, and other kinds of Head Start, <coughs> child care, those kinds of programs. And the U visa victims, and that, but that there are, um, hold on a second, I've got all kinds of charts in here, but I'm going to this. U visa victims will, will not have access to those programs unless they're state funded. And so what happens is, is that U visa victims in the state of California are considered legally residing. And so they get access to public benefits in much the same way as, as VAWA victims do, VAWA self-petitioners. But, um, but the state is paying for CalWORKs instead of TANF. So that the CalWORKs, they have access to TANF. Both VAWA, you and VAWA in, in California have access to TANF, Medicaid, SCHIP, which is a um, state child health insurance program, Food stamps, I can't remember, I'm not sure whether they, I, I think they don't have access to food stamps in California as adults, but the children do. So if you have a U visa victim who's filing for relief and she has two children included in her application, at, or, or they have, um, uh, where, they're, where those children are lawfully present, they will get TANF, Medicaid, and SCHIP. SSI they won't get. If it's a VAWA self-petitioner, the, the case where the batter is a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident, they, the children in those cases will get food stamps. So that's a difference between U visas and, so, and VAWA in California. So the food stamps will go to the children of the self-petitioners, but not the children of the, US, of the U visa victims, because they're not qualified. If you need help on benefits laws, I have an attorney that does nothing but benefits and family and answers questions from people. So you can call my office and ask to speak with Soraya Fata and our contact information is I think on the materials. Okay, I'm closing with what's happening in family court. Can you tell me, well, you heard one example about how immigration status comes up in family court proceedings. Any people have any other ideas of what might happen in family court? Or certain family court actions that could be a problem for immigrant victims? I think it's finding a restraining order by saying, well, she only married this guy for this, so she is only getting a restraining order because she wants to get a new visa. Right. So there's no point in getting into there. Right. So that the attorney, basically the attorney for the husband or the partner of the abuser, is saying she shouldn't have a protection order because she's only doing it to get evidence so that she can get a U visa or a VAWA self-petition. Right, those kinds of things get raised. And in fact, under state law and under basically the law of all the states, um, whether or not you're a victim, if, if, I mean, whether or not you're undocumented, if you're a victim of a crime that occurred in that jurisdiction, you're entitled to protection order no matter what. But they do con often argue that the court has no jurisdiction, absolutely. Um, we have materials on our website for any of you that are seeing it in these cases in terms of how to respond. Um, what, so we see, okay, let me think. And then there are various different ways divorce can harm immigrant victims, and it could be all kinds of cases. So you might have a victim who's the spouse of somebody teaching at Cal State Long Beach or somebody working in the technology field where their visa is tied to their husband's their legal visa. He gets a divorce, her visa ends, she's out of here. Even though she may be a crime victim and could apply for a U visa. But in the meantime, first she doesn't know it. And second of all, um, so the divorce can cut off various forms of immigration relief. So it's important if a divorce is pending with somebody where there's the parties are, where there's an immigration case pending, that you consult with an immigration lawyer before you get the divorce so that you don't cut her off from some kind of relief she's entitled to. But the big issues that we're seeing now, and I'm gonna just turn as I conclude to this couple of cases that are on, that one's ongoing right now, we just filed a brief with the Supreme Court of Missouri. What has happened, and this is one of the questions that we were talking about in the very beginning about backlash. One of the ways we're seeing serious backlash now happening against immigrants 
is we have child, um, child protective services workers in some states, hospitals in other states, are basically reporting immigrant mothers and to the Department of Homeland Security. And so what's happening is, is in the case in Nebraska, this is what happened. Undocumented, K'iche speaking Guatemalan woman, so she doesn't speak Spanish, other than very broken Spanish, takes her six-month-old daughter for a respiratory illness to the emergency room, to the hospital. The hospital gives her a Spanish language interpreter, which she hardly understands. They, she believes they've told her, they gave her medicine, whatever, if the child doesn't get better, bring her back. That's what she believed she was supposed to do. Child got better, she didn't go back. The hospital reported her to Child Protective Services because the hospital says what they said is if you don't come back with your child, we'll report you. So she didn't come back. The child was reported to Child Protective Services. Child Protective Services in Nebraska went out with a police officer to her house to, to see what was going on. Knock on the door, she does what? She does, she lies about who she is because she's afraid this is DHS picking her up. Because she lied about who she was, they figured out who she was and the police arrested her. I guess for lying, I'm not sure what the crime was or what the issue was, but they arrested her and turned her fingerprints over and turned her into DHS. Her children, when she was arrested, the, six, the three month old and the three year old, Kiche speaking kids, well, the three month old didn't speak yet, six month old didn't speak yet, but the three year old did, were placed with a Spanish speaking foster family. She went into detention, she tried to participate in the, child, you know, in the adult protective services cases, and she, she couldn't. DHS wouldn't bring her to the courthouse for the hearings. Ultimately, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, Ultimately, she was deported to Guatemala. And the social worker assigned to the case for the Department of, uh, of uh, Children and Families, I get the number, the DA, uh, for CPS, Children, Child Protective Services from Nebraska, called her in Guatemala, again in Spanish, trying to get her to cooperate with the reunification plan, which was very hard for her to do, obviously, from Guatemala. Long story short, the court terminated her parental rights and was in the process of adopting the children to the foster care. When Maldef called us and we, and Mal, we helped get her a lawyer, um, pro bono law firm, and then we intervened as, um, as an amicus. We came into the case as an amicus, filing an amicus brief, and the good news is we got a, case, we got a ruling out of the Nebraska Supreme Court, an unanimous decision that basically says, and we have the same issue on appeal, and we won the same issue on, at the Court of Appeals level in Missouri recently, that says the parent-child relationship is constitutionally protected. Immigration status, undocumented status, detention and deportation have nothing to do with that parent, with, with, with that they, they do not result, and should not result, in a mother or a father losing custody of their children and termination of parental rights. And that applies to all families without regard to immigration status. And that in, in analyzing the best interests of the child in the termination of parental rights case, the Nebraska court said, these kids were born in the United States, they're gonna be better growing up in foster care here than they are with their natural parent in Guatemala. And they did this comparison of cultures there. Nebraska Supreme Court said you can't do that because comparing cultures has nothing to do with parenting and that you can't take the children away from an undocumented immigrant even if they're detained and even if they're deported unless you can show that, <clears throat> that they are you know, abusing and neglect or neglecting the child. And part of that abuse and neglect decision <coughs> can't be whether they speak English and what country they might be going to. So, the good news is, is that we won the case. We then spent a year and a half getting the Department of Homeland Security to agree to bring Maria Luis back in. She was reunited with her family in Nebraska, given one year to stay in the United States where she's getting counseling and therapy and assistance, and then she's gonna take her home, her kids home to Guatemala. She wants to go back. She, well, she has to go back. She doesn't have legal status here. 
But the point is that one of the things that's happening in this backlash is that children of undocumented parents are getting placed with DHS or with, with, with um, Child Protective Services in various states, and it's happening in different ways. There was a case in Mississippi in which an undocumented woman gave birth, and the Mississippi hospital decided, somebody in the hospital said, she can't care for the children. She's neglecting this newborn baby because she doesn't have legal status, and they took the baby away. That baby's come back, too. But we see this in a variety of different ways, and this is kind of, I think, the new frontier in family law on these issues. And so one of the reasons that we, I do these trainings is I, I want to reemphasize for folks, there's a lot of difference you can make here. We know that immigration status and getting immigration status makes a huge difference in the ability of women to um, be good parents, to move on with their lives, to create a life here for themselves and their children, to be better witnesses in the criminal prosecution of, of perpetrators, and all of that is helped by helping women identify that they're victims and they're eligible for status and moving on to get status. And then having that status helps both the criminal justice system it, and it helps her in family court and it helps her kids um, in terms of her acting to get, protector, to pr get protection and herself also protects her kids. So I want to thank you and what I'd like to do for the last like seven minutes is open it up for remaining questions. I've answered every question. Yes. Remember how you said that perhaps it would be better to start doing the training order to file a petition? But then I said about the red flags. Would it be best for the to send her to get her criminal record to see if there's something there that we should be afraid of? It's always good when you're working with an immigrant victim if there's a way to get her criminal record. You know, you should do it as part of your advocacy. Because knowing that information sooner rather than later is going to be helpful in the immigration case, in the family case, and all of that. So, and it, I assume there's a way in California for people to get their own records, right? We're saying yes. Yeah, there's, it's not a bad idea. I think the real issue is you've got to develop, and I don't need to tell advocates this, you've got to develop a relationship with the client first. Because if the first thing you say is, what's your immigration status, they're not coming back. <laughs> you know? And if the second thing you say is, What's your criminal record? <laughs> you know, they're not coming. So you have to develop a relationship where she can feel safe answering those questions, and therefore you and her can pursue those avenues. But it's always a good idea to know. Yeah. In a, a pending family law scenario, usually during the process of the VAWA, we don't tell the opposing party anything about the VAWA process. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason to continue to keep that confidential after it's granted and after it's complete? Yes. Um, the question was, um, is it is there a reason you don't tell you don't tell the opposing party generally during the family case about the VAWA, and is there any reason not to continue? I think yes, and the reason is. Many families, let's say there's kids, there's an ongoing relationship between the two, and if he they, if he know, sometimes him knowing that she's taken steps to get this immigration status that he's supposed to be able to control, um, just the fact that he knows it may trigger retaliation. And so I think, generally speaking, we don't say anything about it. Um, I can't even realize, I mean, but on the other hand, in a trial, you may want to switch it. You, you might want to do safety with planning with your with your client and say, look, before this immigration, before this particular judge in this custody case, he, we think from what he's done in discovery or whatever that he's going to raise your immigration status. And there's a way. Actually, I've done this in a lot of cases where instead of deciding I'm going to hide it, I decide I'm going to raise it. And that's usually I'm going to raise it myself in my case. Because what I'm going to say is that I'm going to be making the argument to the judge, this is a 10-year marriage, he's a US citizen, she could have had legal papers before. His arguments are, the reason she doesn't have him is that have the papers is that he refused to file. So I put him on the stand in cross-examination and I'd say, isn't it true that you're a US citizen? Yes. And when did you get married? And isn't it true that under US law you can provide immigration status you can file papers? And is it true that you never filed those papers? And you can really cross-examine him to basically show 
that his unwillingness to file papers is part of his power and control over the relationship related to the abuse. And more importantly, if he's saying, I should get custody because I'm the citizen, I'm the one with legal work authorization, I'm the one that can provide, well, isn't it true, sir, that the reason she doesn't have legal work authorization is you never filed for her? And you created this problem, so therefore, since you're working, you pay child support and she has custody. Are yes. there judges like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, there are judges. We get this, we do this all the time. Good. I, I have three back courts. Easter out here, too. I think people are doing it all over the country in various cases. I mean, you have to make a judgment about what that case is, how strong the violence evidence, for example, is. One of the things that you really present here is that the amount the, of stamina and pers persistence and perseverance that a, a immigrant woman victim has to go through to get to the other side is pretty amazing. Yeah. And I'm wondering, um, and from the prevention side, where can we get, before they get to the advocate, what are the sources that we can use to educate immigrant women about their rights right. before they have to come to an advocate? Yeah. One of the things we developed on our website, we have it now in English, Spanish, Hindi, Gujarati, Russian, and Arabic. French is on its way. Is a, um, we have an, uh, it's called Are You Safe at Home? And it's a booklet that goes over their immigration rights. Their, we actually have the Department of Homeland Security read it and verify the breastfeeding mother part of it. I mean, that's all in. There's um, family law protection orders, public benefits access, and they can see what domestic violence is, what their rights are as an immigrant woman. And so we found that to be a good tool to get the word out to people. And my view would be that and any community outreach and education that you can do to any women in the immigrant community. Because it is as important to reach their mother, their sister, and their girlfriend as it is to reach them. And then the other thing that we see, I know that it has started to happen, I heard about it, and the police officers that I was training with in San Francisco were telling us, and advocates was were telling me at the event in, at LAFLA as well in LA, is that as you start doing this, and one woman gets her U visa and cooperates and you know is able to cooperate and he's convicted or prosec prosecuted and convicted, that helps other women come forward. And I certainly know in my experience, my two biggest sources of referral over the 17 years I litigated these cases were women referring other women and the local police bringing women to my doorstep. Those two things. Because with U visa certification, if he's got a case of a victim, He's going to want to refer her so that she has an advocate, not just a certification, but he needs she needs he needs somebody to walk her through the rest of the case so that she can continue cooperating. So, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. We so so very much appreciate you being here. Wow, what a lot of information we all received.